Welcome to the Zao Strength Podcast. My name is Jim Ellie, and I've been coaching powerlifters and strength athletes over the last eight years of my life. I've worked with a wide variety of athletes from hyper-competitive, born-to-powerlift athletes looking to win powerlifting worlds to the guy or girl who casually trains and wants to make the most out of their program. With each lifter comes unique problems to solve to help them push past their next plateau. I started this podcast because selfishly, I wanted to learn more about how other athletes and coaches creatively solve problems that they experience throughout their lifting journey. I want to hear their stories that aren't shared on social media, and I want to share them with you so that you can learn with me as we embark on this journey to becoming strong for life. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with American deadlift record holder, 2018 USAPL national champion and owner of Brazos Valley Strength, David Wilson. What I love about David is that despite the fact that he's an absolute unit and he's added nearly 100 pounds to his total each year, with a current total of 1957 pounds at 105 kilos, his process and his sportsmanship have been top notch throughout his powerlifting journey. David is a self coached athlete, which means that he writes his own programs, analyzes his training data, and combines the objective and subjective data to build training blocks that work for him. What's fascinating is that he also coaches a full roster of clients alongside this. If you're a powerlifting coach and you're listening to this, you probably understand how incredible it is that he can sustain his progress in the sport while coaching full time. I'm so excited to have him on the podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with your friends as we have many more coming. And without further ado, let's get into the episode. Welcome, David Wilson, to the maybe the 15th episode of the Zao Strength podcast. If you've never heard of David, honestly, you should spend more time in the powerlifting world. 2017 was when I first like learned about you. I think you're competing against Bryce Lewis and Ben Rice and LS McLean, I think as well. 2017? Is that, or is it 2018? Was, was this, was this raw nationals yeah. that we're talking about? Yeah. Um, well, Bryce, I think was a still a one Oh five at that point, but Ashton was, was down there. Yeah. Ashton Ruska. Right. I just, I just remember like you showing up and everyone was like, holy shit, David Wilson is here to here to play ever since then you know you've been like if there's like archetypes of powerlifters you know and i feel like if there's an archetype for you it, it's like the the humble hard worker that's also like super uh interested in helping people get stronger you know what i mean like like ashton I, i'm sure is like interested in helping but he's definitely like athlete first from what i can tell like it seems like you're more Round, well-rounded i guess as like a coach and a lifter and like you really think really think about your technique and you're also pretty nerdy about powerlift or programming and stuff like is that is accurate <laughs> yeah yeah and i i mean i i think i've i've kind of tried to answer the question myself you know whether whether i consider myself athlete first or coach first and i i think ultimately like the answer is probably somewhere in the middle is that i probably got into coaching, you know, for the same reasons that, that like, just in the, in the way that I view my own lifting is that, like you said, it's like, I'm kind of treating, I, I think I do a pretty good job of separating myself as an athlete and a coach. And so I've kind of felt like I'm actually coaching myself instead of just like, I don't know, winging it or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then, you know, that, that kind of thought process and mindfulness, I think led to a good process of coaching others. So I, I don't know that I try to like, you know, separate those identities anymore. I think it's just like me applying my own mindset and I don't know, you kind of the, the way that I view myself training to other people and it, it has seemed to work out. Yeah. I was actually, I think I'm glad that you brought up like the self coaching idea because I mean that as a coach, I think it's kind of, cause I don't have a coach either. Uh, I probably sh- should get one, but, uh, you know, there's this thought process that you go through when you coach in period. And it's like, if you can detach from like, I don't know how you go about it. But when I write my own programs, I think of my lifting self as like my client, you know what I mean? It's like, yep. I know how I am when I'm lifting. But that's not really how I am when I'm coaching. You know, like, it's like I can turn on a switch and it's like, okay, let's be thoughtful and process oriented as a coach. And then as a lifter, I just, I kind of want to do what I want to do. You know, how do you 
you know, implement that for yourself? Like, do you feel like it's more of a switch or are you analyzing your training while you're lifting? Like, how do you implement the self coaching process? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, a lot of the processes that, that I've brought into my coaching, like for other lifters are kind of things that I implemented like almost accidentally with myself first was, you know, taking notes about, you know, intra session stuff and like realizing, man, I don't even remember exactly what I was thinking a week ago, you know, like exactly how hard the session was or how it felt or just like kind of the thoughts that I was having while I was doing it. And so trying to bring those processes into getting feedback from clients and like actually emphasizing that those things that they, you know, their inner monologue while they're lifting, like that is what I want to hear. Um, and, and so like understanding that I value that tremendously with myself, um, you know, really trying to, to get athletes to understand that that's a big deal for them. And I, I think you posted something on, on Instagram, maybe in the last week or so, you know, about like getting, uh, maybe, maybe it was the one about like perceived progress and kind of like, you know, buy-in and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been something that I've leaned into a little bit more with myself recently. And, you know, certainly has applied to other clients and that, you know, there's the stuff on paper that, that I, I might write that as a coach, I think this would be perfect for David Wilson to do. Mm -hmm. But then I know like when I'm doing it, I don't want to do it, you know? And like, I'm like, ah, you know, I'd, I'd really prefer to do something else. And I think I've started to take that more seriously that like when I'm writing programming for myself, I need to care about what I want to do. And I think that that's one of the main criticisms of self-coaching, right? That people, people will say like, if you're coaching yourself, you're only going to write what you want to do. It's like, but is that necessarily a bad thing, right? Like if you're giving yourself stuff, you know, you're going to try really hard at, you know, that's probably a really good thing for progress. And you're probably, uh, you're definitely like making sure autonomy is like number one in that, in that decision-making, right? You, you're like, there's no better way to maintain autonomy <laughs> than like literally right. writing your own training. Right, right. And then, you know, I do have to like stick to it, you know, I even even in the blocks that I, you know, I'm having success with, you know, I'm still like, man, maybe I just want to switch this, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. stick to this one, then let's try it afterwards. Um, but you know, a little adaptation throughout the block are probably fine. When you first got into lifting, were you like a program hopper? Um, I, I would probably say, you know, the, the same as as probably, you know, anyone else, you know, like, uh, well, maybe, maybe not now that I'm thinking about it a little bit more. So I actually think that I ran five, three, one for like at least six months, you know, maybe even a full year. Um, and, and, you know, like I, I think maybe looking back on it, you know, one of the, one of the biggest things that has helped me is I don't get bored very easily. You know, that, that if I, if I'm making progress, that is the most fun thing to me. Mm -hmm. And, and so like with five, three, one, I was like, I mean, I'm getting better, you know, so what do I care? Uh, what do I care if I keep doing the same thing over and over? And I think at that point, like maybe I just thought five, three, one is the best program there is. So there's no reason for me to change. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess after that, you know, it, it just started transforming into like, okay, well, five, three, one's pretty good. That's my starting point. Let me just kind of start writing my own stuff. And, and I mean, I didn't do a lot of other free programs, you know, I, I think that's where a lot of people start, but um, I, I think it just kind of started from the very early age, me seeing success with 531 and then slowly kind of self-coaching, self-programming away from that um, and, and, you know, consuming other material to build the foundation from there. So I guess, no, <laughs> I, I think initially when you said, when you asked the question, I thought, yes, but I, I thought about it a little bit more. Yeah, I just find that like the, the there's criticism of program hopping early on for, for similar reasons that there's criticism of self self-coaching it's like if you program hop then you're never going to make progress because you're always changing everything and you know that's bad because change is difficult to you know it's noisy and i think that's probably true it, it just doesn't mean that there aren't benefits to the program hopping you know so so the reason why i say that is without program hopping i would have a lot less of a toolkit early on you know right. you get to i love I lo i'm really like a, a novelty seeker i guess um I think it's like ADHD that I learned is why I'm doing that all the time. But uh, it's like there's this new training style and it's supposed to be good. So I want to try it. Um, and it definitely impacted my actual progress. Like it it actually did because I wouldn't make any progress because every time I change something, it would, it's like I never really pushed. I just 
kept tasting. You know what I mean? Right, right. But then as a coach, it was like, now I have all these things I've tried. Let's give some of that to my lifter and see what happens if if they were to to stick with it for long enough. Like as a as a less competitive athlete, if, if anything, non competitive athlete myself, coaching is like an opportunity to see what would happen if I had <laughs> like either either good genetics or like the ability to follow something long enough to see if it works. You know what I mean? Right. Sure. So like, do you feel like when you're working with an athlete, like? Does it feel like you're coaching a bunch of versions of yourself? You know, like, how do you, do you, do you take from, I mean, surely you take some of your own experiences, but like, how do you view your lifters when it comes to that creative space? Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think I found myself, you know, maybe even more so recently kind of describing my own and, and actually maybe it started like a year ago is that, um, when, when I transitioned away from, Brassus Valley Barbell and became Brassus Valley Strength and all that, I, I started, you know, kind of trying to come up with, you know, how do I, you know, build this brand? How do I promote more content and all that? And one of the things that I did was I started making every program that I write for myself available for free on my website. And and like the big, the big purpose with that, I guess, originally was like, hey, lots of free programs mm-hmm. and all that. But it, it really provided a good opportunity for me to start talking in YouTube videos or even with my athletes, like I could show here's what I'm doing and then talk about why. And then from there, I would say like, Hey, so there's, there's something in my program now that's very similar or exactly the same in, in what you're doing. And here's how, you know, I thought about it with myself. Like, here's how I think it'll apply to you. And like from there, give me your feedback. Right. Yeah. Like, and, and however, however, you know, you respond us doing stuff that's similar, you know, and it can be different from person to person, but like I may have a dramatically different response or a very similar response. And, you know, from the person or even like the, you know, the emotional engagement may be high or low from them and vice versa for me. And so I think, you know, bringing in all of that stuff, I, I think has helped a whole lot and kind of like being more transparent with the way that I'm thinking about my training and showing people what I'm doing uh, has, has helped a whole lot in kind of, you know, getting people to think more similarly to, to, or at least, you know, not think exactly the same way I do, but, you know, think through it in the same process style. Yeah. Do you find that you get like, do people give you feedback? Like, like when they run your program, do they say to you, Hey, I did this and this is what happened. Or do you not really know? You know, it, I think probably you'll, you'll agree with this. I, I feel like it's, uh, you know, a constant struggle to, to get people to provide like the real constructive feedback that you want. Mm-hmm. You know, I think most of the time it's like, Hey, I hit humongous PRs. And, I'm like, and you're like, yes, yes, my program yeah, is so yeah. good. Right. My program, I knew my program was good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so no, I like, I, I say for the most part, you know, the people that are, that are doing it for free, you know, I, I, I actually went into it kind of expecting that as I, I asked for feedback from people and pretty much all I got was like, man, it's so great. And I was like, ah, whatever, you know, yeah. I'm, I, I'm not going to try to keep asking. Um, <laughs> so, so I did expect more of that, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that just kind of, uh, you know, pushes, pushes the, um, the whole thought process of like really trying to, to, you know, delve into lifters understanding of, of like why they feel like what they're doing is working and, and like trying to lean into those things to, you know, create more engagement and everything. I was talking to my lifter yesterday cause I was. I'm not really like a fan of testimonials. Like I, I really am torn when it comes to testimonials because I don't like taking more credit than I deserve for any level of like athletic success. If anything, I like don't view myself as the reason that someone's getting stronger. And so testimonials are really difficult for me to like (laughs) put out there. Um, I mean, even when I was working with like Luke Richardson and like, he was getting crazy strong and I was just like, uh, how, you know, like I never really, like, I, I felt good about it, but I'm also like, right. I don't think I could like replicate this if I don't think it could, like this is, this lifter has what it takes and I'm, right. you know, navigating him a little bit and helping him out. And, and then that's like kind of the role of a coach. And so testimonials make it seem like the role is to is to create. And I don't know if I view myself like that, but what I realized in a call yesterday, cause I'm, I'm trying to like film a testimonial with a lifter that I've been working with since like the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and he was like training in his, in his apartment and like, 
we were just going over like the goals that he set for himself and like where we are now. And like, we realized like he's kind of done everything. Um, and I was asking him like, what do you think, you know, his biggest struggle was? And, um, despite the fact that the pandemic like happened and he was training in apartments and he was moving, he had like five, he trained one time outside at like this outdoor gym with like cold rusty barbells like he would deadlift like in the rain and stuff and like even though all that happened he was like you know i think the biggest obstacle was like my my pec was bothering me because he's been managing like a pec strain for like before even where i i was working with him like it's just the pain that he so associates with with benching is is greater than the overall you know cloud that is the the pandemic of lifting anyway the, the point of that is um he communicated with me like how i helped him but then what i realized was like man if you hadn't communicated with me to the level and to the degree that you did like i wouldn't have any answers for you like right like i wouldn't i, I would be hoping that something that i create out of out of thin air is, is helpful but like my best clients and not like they're the strongest but the ones that work best with me communicate at like a very high level both from like an empathetic standpoint you know they're describing their emotions they're talking about their technique and they're like super aware of that and i find it more difficult especially with online coaching to manage lifters who aren't able to communicate on that level and maybe we teach them and you know that's the gradual process right like one of the roles is to help a lifter better verbalize um how to to give feedback right but what you're mentioning like with people that are doing the program for free they don't give you feedback it's almost like we're benefiting as well not only financially but our knowledge increases from getting clients as long i mean because right. they're committed so i feel like they have more of an incentive to to give you feedback because like what else are you going to do as a coach right do you feel that that's yeah. been useful for you too oh yeah absolutely i i mean just like you said is is there, there are people that I work with that, you know, don't communicate much at all and have a ton of success. And and like you said, is I like, I don't look at that and be like, wow, I'm good at this. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like, I, I feel like that probably would have worked with literally anybody. Like they, they just are a good athlete. Mm -hmm. you know, they have, you know, what it takes, whatever. Yeah. So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, on the other side of it too, is, is I think a lot of times, you know, the people that, that do struggle a little bit that communicate really well, it's like, you know, as far as growth from my perspective, it's, you know, it, it, it makes it, it challenges me, but like over time, obviously I, it's, it's led to a whole lot of improvement to where, you know, now, however many years into coaching I am, I, I feel like those problem solving skills are, are a whole lot better. And, and that like, those are sometimes the more rewarding ones, even though, even though it's like the naturally gifted people, Luke Richardson or whoever, right? <laughs> yeah. Like it, it seems great. But you're like, I don't know if it was me or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I was thinking about this because I was I, one of the things I really like about this podcast when I interview lifter coach combo hybrid <laughs> lifter hybrid coaches um, is that you have a lot more understanding of like the athlete experience and like there uh, most coaches in powerlifting know about the athlete experience, but some kind of deviate closer to coaching and then some are like pure athlete and then I do coaching on that side and it, like you said I think you really are in that middle because you viewed yourself as an athlete for so long um when it comes to like you hitting a plateau and you know you're just trying to figure out like you've 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 not done anything wrong right I've, I've had plenty of lifters and this is like the hardest thing for me is when we we implement the program they do everything right you know they go all out on their training they're accurate with their rpe they get all the sleep in the world they've eat, been eating well and it's like you know those 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 levers are getting fewer and fewer to pull um when that happens with you for yourself what is your first like lever that you pull <laughs> patience probably um yeah you know i as as you were asking the question i was trying to come up with like you know really trying to think about myself i guess because that's probably you know, where I would have the most insight as both athlete and coach, you know, not necessarily what I would do for other people all the time. But um, yeah, I mean, certainly looking back on on times that, that I have, you know, plateaued to some degree, I I can't remember, you know, anything specifically with, you know, with any lift that I've done that was like, oh, I reduced volume, I, you know, increased in, uh, intensity, whatever, right? Like, I, I can't remember anything that happened 
you know, it was, it was just continuing to, to put in, you know, just work in, work in, work in and like finding a groove and, and, uh, you know, continuing to stay patient and engaged and all that. And I, and I really think that one of the, you know, referring to one of the posts that you just had about like, you know, perception of progress, you know, as I, I think that that is something that has probably helped me a whole lot is that even though, you know, on paper, I may not see, you know, a lift progressing. I think I've done a good job of creating scenarios to where I can find areas that I can progress in whatever way, right? Like, you know, if I'm, if I'm able to do more work at a given percentage and like pretty comfortable and I feel like, you know, I'm not fatiguing as fast or whatever, right? Like my one rep max isn't going up. I'm still hitting that same, you know, squat single. And, but it's like, but I really feel like I'm squatting pretty effectively <laughs> right now. And so it's like, okay, well, like that feels like my squat is improving. You know, just keep doing that, right? And and wait for it and keep like trying little tweaks that you know have been successful before. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be a big mistake to try to like, all right, well, let's just, you know, here's one lever change everything, yeah. right? Um, You know, and that's, that's something to do in the moment, but for sure, I think, I mean, patience, but looking for, you know, other markers that, that feel like progress, just, you know, your perception of it more so than anything else. And, and like really actually trying to buy into those things uh, more so than like forcing, you know, rep PRs or, or those kind of things. It actually, that makes me question. Cause like, I'm, I work with some lifters who are on the national level, but a lot of the people I work with are like aspiring national lifters or they just want to get stronger in the gym you know they just kind of are kind of like me or like they really like powerlifting but mostly just want some help making progress um so i don't at least of recently i haven't worked with a lot of lifters um at like the the usapl level a lot of mine are international anyway speaking of like levers to pull i always hear and i'm sure you have as well that you know, if you're, if you're getting stronger and your fatigue is low, then like add volume or like, if you're, if you're plateauing and you know, things aren't moving, you're not getting hurt. Yeah. Just like throw some volume, throw some, some stress at your training. And I find that probably works. Um, but since you're coaching yourself, how do you know how much it, like one, is that statement true for you? Right. And then two, if it is true, how much do you add like as a, as a relative percentage? And then like, yeah, I guess what happens after that? You know what I mean? Like, how do you, how do you push yourself in your training both like physically, but then also as a coach, like how do you push the program to elicit the progress for you? Yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, what, what you said is probably, you know, the, the, the perception that I had for a while, right? Like if you're doing pretty well, like let's just keep kind of adding work, right? If you feel pretty good. Um, and, and I, I still, you know, I hear that all the time from all my athletes, you know, it's like, Oh, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. I think I do a little bit more work. And, and this is certainly an, an area that I've been having a lot more conversations with athletes on. And, and for sure myself, I would say that this specifically is something that has held me back for a long time. And that I, I think as an athlete and, most, most like athletic leaning kind of like, you know, tough people or whatever, right? Like powerlifting is not an easy sport. You know, people, people who get into it really at any level are probably more predisposition to be willing to suffer than, you know, the average person. So, you know, like their perception of how much work they should be doing may be a little bit different, but I certainly have moved more and more away from like work in general. And, and I've, I'm kind of like, in general with myself sort of trying to test the lower boundaries of like how much can I do and get stronger. And, and, and I, I think that maybe the important thing about that is that it's the lower boundaries of like my perception of work, but also understanding like I'm pretty tough. I'm pretty willing to like work hard, you know? <laughs> and, and, and so like, is that amount of work actually little? And like, you know, no, probably not. Like I'm working pretty hard in the gym, but like, I could do more. Mm -hmm. And, and so like right now, you know, for, for example, kind of like looking at my own program, I'm doing the least amount of competition squatting I've ever done in my life. I'm doing like four total sets a week. Um, and like just on paper, it's, it's getting better than it ever has. And, 
you know, there's, there's other stuff going on, like, you know, pushing some accessories harder and, you know, I'm healthier than I was a couple of months ago. And, and, you know, there's a lot of other things that are kind of like, you know, landing as far as timing, but, but yeah, I mean, like I, I would say that, you know, volume more so than not is like one of the last levers that I try to pull, especially pushing it like, okay, we're going to give you more that that's like that, that I really, really hesitate to do that. Like with somebody who's, who's really not making progress. And so I, you know, try to put people in a situation and, you know, there may be some bias here, but um, put people in a situation that they really feel like they're fresh enough every session that they can go in and like try very, very hard, you know? Um, so, you know, if you're going in and feeling fresh all the time, like I think people say like, well, I could do more work. Like, yeah, but if you're feeling good and you're able to attack these things, you're getting stronger. Like I really don't want to give you more. And, and so when people feel like they stagnate, I think more often than not, I, I say like, well, maybe we pull out one set or, you know, we try to, you know, and, and then there's, there's for sure diminishing returns, right? I think we all have that feeling when we go in and we just like, I just don't feel like I'm doing enough squat reps overall to like even have sensation of my legs when I squat. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, like now we're starting to feel a little bit lost. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not like, you know, we, we want to get it rock bottom, but you know, en enough reps to feel like you're in the groove, but you know, you ideally go into the sessions, you know, feeling good enough to like really go pretty hard. Um, so yeah, like I, I'd say for sure volume is like the last lever I pull and more. So it's like all the other stuff to try to create good situations for people to be able to feel good and train hard. I'm really glad the way you answered that because it's, it's very validating for my own practice because it's, it's because I'm so used to what you said, like pulling volume the last, I'm also like unsure of when is it actually time to pull the volume lever? You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm so much in line with what you're describing, but then it's also like, maybe it is the volume. You know what I mean? Like right. maybe that is the thing. Cause it, it's so uncommon for me to pull that lever because usually like you mentioned, like sometimes pulling sets out actually produces greater returns. And I've found that especially during the pandemic that that's been like super useful because I think people, my hypothesis is that people have a, a lot less, um, their work capacity is a lot lower. Their total step counts a lot lower. They're, they're just moving so much less that like a lot of volume after like sitting at, if you're working from home or whatever all day, it's just not the same as like the pre pandemic. You're always on the move. Like you're, you're walking a lot or whatever. And then, Hey, I got to go to the gym and train. Like it's more of a continuous day. Whereas like for me, I, I sit here, you know, most of the day and then when I'm ready to go, I go over there and I train. But like, if I were to just slam volume, man, that's a considerable increase in stress from like my average movement pattern through the day. You know what I mean? Right. Right. I mean, when pandemic stuff started happening, you know, I, I went from owning a gym and being up there and like on my feet all day, every day and walking around and like, you know, I could train all day and all that, but then, you know, now I'm just sitting at home all day and like kind of trying to do the same training. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't feel more fresh, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, maybe worse, but, but yeah. So I, I mean, there's, there's obviously like, you know, whatever, you know, mindset related things, like just kind of feeling out of sorts. But um, yeah, I mean, for sure, like, even though my on paper recovery capacity was significantly more like adding more would not have been the right thing for me. And, and yeah, I mean, I guess I just always, I always think about like, you we see we see some high level people, you know, doing Oh, today was, you know, six sets of six on squats, you know, and like a seven RP or whatever. I'm like, well, they're getting pretty strong. Maybe that's something I should like push on people more. But you know, if I'm doing, you know, three sets of five, like at what point, if I would do three sets of five on anything, right. And then I make it four sets of five, five sets of five, six sets of five, like where, where is that value? Like how much value per set am I getting and how sore, how fatigued, how much does it reduce my willingness to do those sessions and my try hard and like over time throughout the period of a block, like if I just see every day man, those five to five, like, they're not that hard, but like, uh, you know, I, I, like <laughs> yeah. just that session takes so long, like, we'll cut out two of them mm -hmm. and, and like try harder at them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly been, you know, my, my, I think go to is, is maybe, maybe the best way to say it is like as many sets, as many, as much work as we can put in there that I know will get their full attention, you know, for the most part. Yeah. It kind of sounds like you're talking a lot about like intention and like effort per set and, I, yeah, it just seems like, so especially with newer, 
I don't even know if it's newer. I guess it's just like you have to have this paradigm shift. Like the thing you're describing is really a paradigm shift that that happens or has to happen at some point during your lifting career that just just doing the movements, like just hitting a top set and then five sets of five on the back off, like on its own probably won't allow for the the growth that the lifter is expecting. You know, like, and I'm sure you're kind of talking about that, right? It's not like... No, it's like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about, right? Just going through the motions is probably not, like, just doing squat reps is probably not the thing that's going to get somebody stronger at their squat, mm-hmm. right? Like, being very deliberate about it. And I, and I think maybe sort of, like, tangentially, you know, more and more with, uh, like, you know, variations and those kind of things. Like, I, I really have my doubts on what variations do as far as like the physical improvements in strength, you know? So like if I do a, a pause squat, you know, a two count pause squat at the bottom, like, are we getting stronger in the bottom? You know, I, I don't know, but you know, if we make it, if we're make, doing very hard, deliberate two count pause, sweat, you know, whatever, a, a hard triple or something, and they execute it very well, like they're being very mindful and like really bringing in a lot of intent, intent to the set, you know? And, high attention. So that process probably is a much bigger driver than me saying like, well, we're going to do this hard. We're doing six sets of five today. They're going to be pretty hard, you know, like just get it done, you know? And, and so I, that's, that's definitely the direction I would, I would lean towards. I've had lifters too, and it's not their fault. You know, they, they'll start with me and they'll, they'll miss a a few sets of training and they'll say like, Oh, I'll make it up on, you know, this other, other workout. Like, and I'm like, no, don't make it up. Like, I don't want <laughs> yeah, just like, right. the, the ship has sailed for that, you know, day. We have another right. focus now. Um, and I think that's yeah, I like you mentioned. Way. Do you have that happen a lot? Yeah, I do. And, and you know, I, I think, again, it, you know, one of the one of the things that I, I guess maybe I'm trying to do is, is like understand that the population that we're talking to is people that really do want to work hard. Um, you know, on, on average, right. Like they may not be the best communicators Mm -hmm. that, you know, and, and, you know, give the information, but like on average, the, the people who are signing up for powerlifting coaching are saying like, I'm very willing to, to work Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm going to do everything it takes to get as good as I possibly can. And, and so like definitely built into that is like, Oh God, I missed this session. You know? Okay. So now I had my squat and bench session yesterday and now it's time to do deadlift and bench. I guess I got to do it all, you know, and I, I did all my bench press, all my accessories and all my squats and my deadlifts. I'm like, man, you know, <laughs> like that, I mean, good, you know, bless your heart. Thanks for trying so hard. Yeah. But, you know, that, that is not what, you know, like if I've never written a session that looks similar to that ever, you know, that, that it's so much more volume and everything than you've ever done in any, any one session, like there's probably a reason for that, yeah. you know? Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it just goes back to like understanding the population, like does generally want to work and kind of like putting that into how we kind of frame everything. Yeah. And also for those listening, I hope I'm not coming off. Like my lifters are so dumb. They, <laughs> why would they do that? It's it's definitely not what I mean. It's more actually like a, 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 a talking point for myself to remember that like part of our job is to communicate like what the point of the training sessions are so that then they can make better decisions. And then that type of thing probably would happen less. I mean, it's not that you should never make up training sessions. Like I think if you miss an entire exercise, like I've definitely put, you know, an extra bench session in and been totally cool with the lifter doing that too. If like they have a squat only session and they miss their bench or earlier in the week, like, yeah, do, do that on the squat session. But yeah, it's like, it's like stacking, you know, the, if the total stress is like a significant chunk higher on that session than any other training session during the week, and you intend to get back to it as normal the following week, then that right. one s- session, the recovery that you might have from that, it, it just might be that uh, it might not be <laughs> conducive to a good block because you're not doing yeah. it all the time, right? They say, "Hey, I was I was sick the the first two or three days of the week, so I couldn't I couldn't train, and and so I'm trying to go back on schedule. So I did five days of training in two days yeah. this week. <laughs> yeah, and you were sick, you know? Yeah. Like, come on, what do you just don't, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just, just start again, just get going. It's probably better, you know, 
like I imagine that they're really receptive to you as, as, as well. Like, you know, you, you've accomplished a lot. Like you recently said the new deadlift American record, right? Is it, you still hold that? Like, is it, has it? Well, yeah, I guess now it, I'll hold it forever because the weight class. Oh, is Oh, right. Yeah. I, so I imagine people are like, oh yeah, David does this too. You know what I mean? You know, I, I think I actually, my, my thought is almost the opposite is, is that like, you know, the people that I coach at times, I think when I say that kind of stuff and, and, you know, I, I obviously people getting injured or whatever, and kind of like trying to manage those kind of things that I think is kind of related here, like people wanting to do too much, you know, their pec is hurting or whatever. And like, they just like, I gotta get some training in uh -huh. and like going too hard. And I'm like, you gotta, you gotta chill. Yeah. And, and I think my reaction or like my interpretation, I think of what people, their response to me is, is almost the opposite. And, and I think less often is it's like, okay, you know, this is what David would do. And I think it's what I see more often is people like, okay, well, easy for you to say, right? Like you do, you've had held American records. Like you've had all this success, right? Like it's easy for you to tell me to like mm. chill, like you've done all this stuff. Like I want to work hard to get there. And, and so like, you know, I, again, trying to like bring in personal experience and anecdote into people and like, like, man, just cause you don't see me not like taking all this time easy. doesn't mean I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like what you see from people at the top is the highlight real stuff. So, um, you know, I, I, I think it's, there certainly are people that I think have like taken solace in the fact that like David's been through it too. He had to really chill. He had to do all these light sessions. He had to skip training sessions and all that. Um, but, but I, I think sometimes it actually gets the, the opposite reaction so kind of because they, they, they see it as somebody who's like, well, he's been there. He, he must've like worked really hard. That's so, I would, I, that makes sense. Um, I just wouldn't have guessed it, but that makes like, and it kind of comes down to where the lifters, where the lifters coming from. Like what's their, what's their insecurity or like, what's their drive? You know, what's the, what's, what do they tell themselves when they're, when they're on their own, you know, like while they're in the gym, like what's in what's going on in their, in their head. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I mean, I think it, it really is like the people who struggle with making the, the kind of the right decisions to remove work or skip sessions or whatever, not combine stuff. It's like, it's people who are like right on the edge, mm -hmm. you know, it's people who view themselves as like really, really close to, you know, kind of how they would view, you know, their success. Um, but like just, just under it. And so they like, there's obviously that fear that if like, if I don't, put in the work, right? Like I'm tough enough, even though my pec hurts, like I can do extra, I can do such and such. And like, if I just don't, if I, if I stop working, I'm not going to get there. And, and so it's like those people kind of like out of that desperation and like, you know, I've been there, uh, you know? And so I, I think they're probably right is it probably is easier for me to say now, but it's also easier for me to say that because I've been there and done that. Right. It's like, I've made those bad decisions. I've, I've struggled with that and I've delayed you know, some progress because of trying to be too tough and push too hard and combining sessions and all those kind of things. So, so yeah, I mean, I guess they are probably right that it's, it's easy for me to say it now, but like, I guess that's my role. Right. I mean, that's why they're, you're, you're, you're almost like stealing experience. Like, like kind of how you can view a coach sometimes if, if they're an athlete too, right. It's like, you're stealing experience from them. And if you're, if you really trust them, like you can, you can be confident that they're not just saying it to, to say it. And right. And that makes me think of, um, this, I don't know what it's probably some like theory or whatever. I guess it's like opportunity cost is the main idea, but it's like, there is a consequence to any action. And it reminds me of like meat, meat day is probably the most like, this is where this, this statement holds the most true. So, if you do something right and it, it yields a result, let's say you, you, you follow the meet day plan and you don't deviate at all. And like doing that on its own, you get first place, you know, you're gonna be like, people are going to tell you awesome job following the meet day plan. Like that was the best thing ever. Good job. Like everyone should follow the meet day plan. If you follow the meet day plan and you get second, it's like, why don't you, why don't you go up, you know, 10 kilos, 15, 20 kilos from the plan. Like, that's what people will say, especially if your third deadlift or your third, whatever the third one is, was successful and you like hit it. Um, I, I think it's probably an experience, but I've even had like coaches talk to me, like, why don't you just have them go up X percentage over the goal? And it's like, because 
if they miss, it's not just missing sometimes. Sometimes it's it's injury. You know, sometimes right. it's it's a negative like feedback loop in their brain. And now the block that's coming up is like 10 times more important because they had a, a five kilo increase and that would have been good for them. They would have been able to show progress. We go up 10. Now there's, what is the growth, you know, or right. did they get hurt? And, and like the same for coaching in general, it's like, if it's going well, like you mentioned earlier, like you're not doing all the volume, but you're, you're getting stronger. Like there is a potential consequence to changing the plan that we don't know about yet. Right. You know what I mean? Do you experience that? Like, do you, while you're coaching and like, while you're, while you're training as well, that like concept? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, and I, I think it, it is kind of exactly what you said is, is that like being following a plan being slightly conservative and, and just allowing that stuff to continue to grow, you know, is, is, is so much more valuable than potentially pushing, you know, for like the little bit of little bit of perceived gain. Um, and, and I mean, you know, the athlete, Dave Wilson, I guess, just had similar experience at the Virginia pro is that, um, you know, I had big plans as far as like, you know, I'm going to total 2000 pounds and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, potentially set this deadlift record and all that. And I didn't bench all that well. So kind of like it, it made it significantly more risky for me to push really hard on my deadlifts. And my deadlifts ultimately ended up looking like incredibly easy. And I, I pulled, you know, the American record, you know, chipped it by half a kilo. And I mean, I had 10, 15 kilos probably comfortably in the tank. And, and I, I think, you know, the main thing that I heard from people was like, oh my God, like, why didn't you go up? And it was like, I feel really good <laughs> yeah. about what I just did. Like I, I was kind of hurt heading into this block. I really wasn't able to train all that well. Um, you know, I really didn't know what my deadlifts were going to be like, um, you know, after, after my bench press, you know, took off a little bit of what I really thought I could do. Then the, the plan kind of changed. Like, here's what my perception of like, you know, success is for right now. And, you know, after my, my deadlift opener, you know, my handler was like, dude, you absolutely can do more. And I was like, stop it. <laughs> you know, no, mm -hmm. because like there, there's risk, you know, and like what, I don't know what I gain necessarily from you know, pushing 10 kilos, 15 kilos higher. And like, if I, if I miss or whatever, but, you know, walking away with, you know, what felt like a really big success, even though on paper, it could have been bigger. Like I walked away from that meat feeling like I feel so confident. And, and I think that right now is reflected in my current training to where like, now I'm like, dude, you were hurt. <laughs> you know, you, you still had this really good meat. You were conservative. You followed the plan and you're awesome, right? Like just keep following the plan. And so like that confidence and everything that, that built from having the really good experience is probably better now than me sending it too much, mm -hmm. you know, and missing my third deadlift or whatever, um, you know, and ending up with a different total. But, you know, and I, I think that that absolutely happens in training all the time, right? Is that I think we're always looking for, if I, if I just did, I could do a little bit more. I could, I could push a little bit harder. Like, man, if we just did this, like, but we have no idea what, like, if that, if that goes wrong, if it, if it creates a problem, like, what is that boom? And like, now, yeah. like, oh, I thought it would go so well. And now I'm not confident anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I love that that happened. I, I didn't even know. I mean, I, I knew the deadlift as well, but I'm always thinking like that. I'm always like, yeah, it look good. You know, it's like, that's the point. Right. And I think that people don't understand what you had to do mentally to like, make it feel good. You know, it's not like. It's hard because people talk about RPE, they talk about, you know, what, what's in the tank, but it's like, there is a, there's a novelty to like, this is the American record and I'm capable of it. And I, I mean, you have to tell me, but it's like, there's that novelty there and you're excited and you know how to pull and you know, it's in the bag and you're going to kill it. That's a different experience than like, this is 10 kilos over the American record. I don't need it. Like, what if I, like, I'm not saying that would be the alternate mindset, but it's like, it's not the same. You know what I mean? Like it could have fucking yeah. missed it. Right. And, and I mean, I, I, I think that that's still there, even with the one that I knew that I was going to just like, just murder, mm -hmm. you know, is that even, even then I walk out there and I'm like, like this is pretty heavy, you know, yeah. this is, you know, 10 kilos more than I've ever pulled before. You know, like I know for a fact I can crush this thing, but 
you know, there's all that other, you know, kind of even even they're walking off of that one, there's doubts and hesitation and those kind of things. And and so, yeah, I mean, for sure, going out there knowing you're going to you're going to murder it like and and that that breeds more confidence in training, more confidence at the next competition. And like just knowing that I can have that emotion when I'm standing there, you know, about to approach the bar that I like that I feel some of those doubts, even though like logically I'm incredibly confident, but I'm standing there and I'm like, I could miss it, you yeah. know, but like, right. but like practicing, you know, practicing that moment and executing and like, and having it feel as amazing as it did like that, you know, that mental image will be in my head for sure. The next time I head into a competition, and it's a heavy deadlift, even if it's significantly above whatever, like if I've never pulled, if I'm going for 390 now that I've never touched anything close, I'm like that other one was 10 kilos more you've ever touched, like just go. Right. Yeah. And, and so like now the last kind of the last emotion I have was just of me having a very, very successful deadlift at the end, more so than like, Oh man, what happened? Yeah. I, like I, I thought I could do it. It was a little bit too hard. <laughs> yeah. Cause you see that with lifters all the time. Like they, they miss at the top and then they're like, all right, new game plan. We're doing hook right. grip or we're doing this thing. And then we're going to do pause deadlifts. And it's like, what? Like you had a good and my day. My back like, needs to get stronger. Yeah, and, right? yeah. Like I need to change all this stuff. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know, dude. You look pretty good. <laughs> yeah, like you got third in the fucking world. Like, you know. Right. Um, and so as a coach, it's it's I think like you mentioned your lifters say, like, hey, that's easier for you to say. I don't think lifters tell me, like, well, you don't know nothing. You're not a you're not a world. Like luckily, otherwise I would uh I would have a lot less confidence, you know, with my coaching abilities. But learning from like like these experiences that you're describing. And like one of the things that I found as a coach too, it's like, it's not about me, you know, like your handler, like it's not about them that you pull 10 kilos more, not that they did a bad thing or whatever, but just like when you're working with somebody, if you really take yourself out of it, at least as much as you can, you know, uh, with while remaining em empathetic, it's like, it's a lot easier to make decisions because you're, you're, thinking about what's best for that lifter in that moment and considering right. their, their long-term progress, you know, and I think like newer coaches have this tougher time with that concept because they are also thinking about the successful coaches who are also successful athletes. And it's like, that's not taking away from your success as a coach being a successful lifter, but you still kind of have to, I imagine you still have to take yourself out of the, scenario a little bit while while empathizing at the same time you know what i mean right yeah i i mean i i rarely at this point you know have i i, I think you know like you said is that, that people do have a, a good amount of like built-in trust in the you know obviously my coaching but then like understanding that i have experience as an athlete like with the temp selection stuff um but like you know it's still every now and then there's definitely some some pushback there and i think one of one of the things i like I really try to emphasize when I'm talking to people, it's like my goal here, like I want you to do the best you possibly can at this competition. Like there's no way, like why would I choose numbers that I, I think are lighter than, I, I would love for you to have the best meat of your entire life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that is so, that's all I want for you here, right? Mm -hmm. And and so it's, you know, it's not like, I don't know. I, I think, you know, this is another one of those that's like where, where people look at it and like, well, it's easy for you to say, like, you've hit, you know, really big numbers and all that. It's like, yeah, because I've learned these things, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I've gotten better at, at, uh, you know, doing the right, you know, taking, being the coach in the moment more so than like David Wilson, the athlete, you know, wanting the numbers he wants to hit and, you know, trying to, trying to take that out. So, so yeah, I mean, for sure, I, that, that's, uh, that's certainly something that I think some of the like, upper like you know the people who are just below where they really want to be i think you know struggle with like really trying to have the absolute best you know day on the platform you know programming like everything like you know they have a really good a really successful you know meet or whatever and like well now i want to use change on my squat because mm -hmm. that last squat was kind of hard i really feel like i struggled I'm like yeah but you also like improved your squat you know seven and a half kilos you know in the last three or four months like I, I don't know that I want to add chains now. Like we might not get that seven and a half kilos in that time frame anymore mm -hmm. because we're doing something weird. Yeah. Well, and it makes me think of what you said earlier about like, you don't know if the two count pause squad is like physiologically changing something about the lift and maybe it's more like the intent. And I feel like that's been how into, to a fault, maybe like I have to think about what is the lifter going to think and feel and experience for a given exercise. 
like like i i just created this exercise with my lifter um the 300 acceleration squat um I don't know if you've ever tried something like this, but no, I've, I've seen you posting those and I actually have like, there's like two or three lifters that I'm probably going to give them to here pretty soon. Cause it's like exactly what I need. I need you to be a little bit more controlled through the top and then you're good. Yeah. But, yeah it's crazy because so, like, I, I, uh, I really don't think anyone else ever done it before or at least written it out as I have. And it was very much like you said, it's like I had a lifter that was really slow with their eccentric, like way too slow. And I'm like, you're missing the, you know, cause the two count, for example, all the variations we were doing were like either tempo eccentrics to, to the bottom or pause pin, you know, something at the bottom and there's nothing really in between. And there's nothing about squatting that needs the bottom to be paused. You know what I mean? Like you don't need right. to pause at the bottom. There's no benefit. Whereas obviously with the bench press, you, there is, um, and I'm not saying there's no benefit to pause squatting, but for the movement itself, what we need is actually to, to increase the transfer of speed from the top to the bottom, you know, that, that transition zone is important. Right. And right. he was like, understanding that. And he's like, yeah, that's what I need too. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, how about, because we benefit from the tempo to some degree, let's just combine them half, you know, three count from the from top half. And also I've, I've understood it better. So like what I'll, as you as you describe it, maybe you take it and, and change it into something else. Uh, the three O acceleration is three count to the sticking point, and then accelerate from there. So like that's going to be different for everyone. Like I have a lifter where there's sticking points like at the top of the squat, and I'm kind of experimenting with this right now. I don't know sure. what will happen, but that's been a better way for me to understand it versus just three count for the first range, first half, and then accelerate through the second. My understanding is if we accelerate or tempo to the weak range of motion, maybe that's like, it's kind of like a pendulum, right? If you, if you drop the pendulum at a certain point, then that's where the momentum will be carried to. Right, right, right. If you yeah. start too high, then maybe your, your, uh, the momentum isn't like good enough or it's not as quality or you're, you're missing out on some of the balance. Yeah. But if you start at the sticking point, then maybe that's like just the right amount of momentum they need to then power power through or, or train them to to use that stress reflex to their, their advantage but anyway that entire exercise only happened because i was trying to visualize like what is the lifter experiencing with the squat and how can we like better their understanding of it or, or, or increase their confidence in this in the in that area that they're struggling with because like right you never you never have you ever implemented actually like a double pause squat i had a lifter ask me that this morning I, i've never done that no, I, I had somebody like ask about them, you know, they were uh, like, oh, I think I'm like moving out of the hole, you know, it's shifting and like maybe we could do, you know, the, whatever, I guess like even like the the up, back down and back yeah. up or like, you know, pause on the way up, whatever. And, uh, and like, I, I kind of pushed back against that one. But, you know, like, you know, in the same way, like kind of what you just said is, is I, I really do encourage people to, to express like, even if it, I think it's something silly, you know, like. I want to do these, you know, up and down pause squat kind of things. I'm like, okay, well, while I don't think that's the right exercise, like probably for anybody, what, what feeling are they feeling like they're struggling with? And, and so then what do I have in my tool bag or what even exercise have I not come up with yet? Like the 300 acceleration mm -hmm. squats, like what, what sensation are they struggling with? You know? And, and so like, that's how they're, their mind like articulated or like that's something they've seen and you know, it, that's kind of where they landed. And so then I guess it's, you know, my job as the coach to interpret what they're saying. And I mean, so it's like not necessarily give them exactly what they say, but you know, give them what they need, mm -hmm. what they feel um, to, to kind of meet them for, for what we're trying to accomplish with that. So, yeah, I mean, like I, I saw you doing those and it, it clicked, you know, in a lot of ways for me as I saw that, those and I thought, that that I think would serve a lot for you know a lot of people that I'm struggling with with like you know certain sensations. So um, yeah, I mean, I definitely I definitely am on board with that variation yes. more so than double pause squats or whatever. Yeah, it's it's so interesting just knowing though that there's lifters that have you know I think this is more of a bigger concept, but just like these ideas of like you know building strength out of the bottom or like um. I and mean, all of the variations that we do, you know, they have intentions and then it's like, are those intentions going to carry over for the lifter? Um, and there's gotta be something more, more 
psychological than just like, well, the, the chest level pin press trains the teaches the lifter to, to push through inertia. And it's like, it, it can, but they have to know that that's what the intention is and know how to get that out of it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. Right. I, and I mean, I think that is a, that exercise maybe specifically is a good example of it, right? Like if you were to give that to me, you know, I have the sensations that I'm trying to feel like I would probably like just go after it naturally. But, you know, if I give it to a lifter that's kind of like already struggling in that way, you know, I, I think at times it may do the opposite, right? Is, is that they're like kind of lost in that area. Mm -hmm. And so then they get this exercise and it's like, this one just feels so horrible, you know, and like now I'm even more lost with bench press. And like, that's, you know, ultimately on us to be like, okay, well, like, these sensations that you're feeling, like you're feeling like it's bad kind of because you don't know how to like, here's what I need you to understand and feel. And like the areas you're lost or like, that's the areas that we're going after. Um, so you know, <clears throat> putting the right weights on the bar to allow that to, to happen. Yeah. And one of the things I've been implementing or communicating a little bit more is like, we're not, we're not doing these exercises as like a separate entity of the main lift. Like they're not, I don't like to think of the chest little pin press as its own movement. Like it is, but I like to think of it as how, what are we trying to get out of this? Like, what am I trying to feel here? And then like, what is that supposed to teach me for, for the main lift? Because otherwise, right. what's the point of doing the variation? I mean, it, it could just be like a different thing and they get, they get the movement in and they don't have to think about it. And, and that could be a thing that they need, right? They need to not think so much about competition exercises and yeah. you know, it might be too stressful for them. That's also a thing, but still I have lifters that are, get really frustrated that their, you know, pause bench is, is so much weaker than their, their main lift or, or vice versa. And one of the things I say is like, that's fine because we're trying to like get something out of this movement and we're not trying to match like people will ask what's the percentage of uh, my main lift for for like chain squats for example it's like uh i have no idea you know like <laughs> I, I, yeah. or what's the per what should i be doing for my um yeah my tempo variation it's like yes it's its own movement and that the load that you're going to use is different um, but we're trying to get something out of this. So you got to put the load on the bar to get the thing that we're trying to trying to get out of the movement. You know what I mean? Right. And right. that's been helpful. I think uh, to some degree, because I think a lot of lifters that want to perform, they want to execute, they want to work hard. Also want all of their lifts to be just killing it. You know, want to hit PRs and all these things. And like, I don't know, I guess I've had blocks where my, every other lift is going, maybe not down, but it stays the same, right? Like I maintain strength on like the pin press, but then my bench goes up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I mean, I, I, that's, again, I think that, that goes back to like your, your perception of progress, right? Is that, um, I mean, I, I could like incline press for me. I, I don't know that I've gotten stronger at incline press in like five years, <laughs> yeah. but I know when I'm not doing it, I feel like I bench worse. Mm. And, and so it's like, I, I don't know, you know, why, why am I not getting stronger at, at incline press, but why do I also have like a really high association between myself and like doing incline press, making my bench press stronger. And I don't know, I, I don't have an answer. Right. But you know, whether it's higher reps or, you know, kind of heavier loads, whatever, like I, I don't care. Right. It's, yeah. it's helping in some way, yeah. you know, that, that emphasizes what I need to be doing on my bench press. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that that's the, like really trying to challenge lifters to be mindful of like, here's the intent of the exercise. Right. And like, here's what we're trying to get you to feel right. Like now is your bench press improving. It's like, well, my pin press didn't ever go up, but like, I still feel better bench pressing right now. Like, I don't really care. Yeah. I, don't, I don't care if you're a great pin presser or not, yeah. you know, but your bench press improved. Yeah. That's a good thing to, to kind of highlight there. The last like talking point that I wanted to go over is like, has, has the pandemic, um, and maybe not the pandemic itself, but like, there's been a lot that's happened in powerlifting over the last two years like has any of the whether it's the pandemic or like the competitions or the federation changes or whatever like has that impacted your drive like has it impacted you in any way and like if so how uh, initially it, it impacted me a lot more than i thought it would like you know motivation wise and everything um you know i there i guess there was you know some stuff i it ended up being a really good thing but um ended up selling my gym you know and and that that was a, a pretty major lifestyle change and like ended up me training out of my garage all the time. Um, you know, and, and I 
going back, like originally I was kind of a solo lifter and then I got really used to training around people and having that motivation and drive and everything. And, and then, you know, for especially the first year training out of the garage, like I and no competitions and, um, or even like training kind of poorly and signing up for a meet and then be like, I don't feel ready and dropping out. Like for me, motivation was really low. And, and I, you know, obviously it was all the lifestyle stuff, right? I was insulated, I guess, from the pandemic itself, being able to work from home and, you know, my clientele didn't drop off a ton. You know, most people are able to like wrangle stuff up. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that that changed a whole lot for, for me, like emotionally and especially, you know, in the moment before getting back to normal. But I, I think again, like that, that really emphasized a lot of the, you know, a lot of the stuff we talked about earlier was like training readiness and buy-in and like, you know, kind of meeting because I ultimately ended up changing a lot about the way that I was writing myself. Like I, I took into account more my emotional state, right? Like kind of my, like, I don't want to be doing the stuff that I have always been doing. I'm going to do stuff a little bit differently now. And like tried to just like re reorganize and get myself back to, to where I am. So like, you know, from, from that perspective, I think I learned a whole lot. Um, and, and it, maybe, maybe it even brought in some of the, the like lower volume kind of stuff, because I, I imagine you, you probably experienced this too, was that you know, lifters training at home with like very limited equipment, like a lot of times weren't able to get a ton stronger, like in the moment and like, you know, visually might be getting weaker, but then, you know, just going through the motions, even people like doing body weight squats and pushups and stuff, you know, they would go back to the gym and like a month, six weeks later, were like, you know, as good as they ever were. And so then that, that really, you know, brought in a lot of like, Hmm, you know, yeah. Insight. Maybe we really don't need to be, you know, constantly, we can really do a lot less at times, mm -hmm. right? Like if they're feeling beat up, we can be more aggressive with how much we pull out. And like, if they're feeling good, you know, we like give them stuff, let them go, you know, give them, give them the, the, the lead, let them run. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that was one of the more insightful things for me um, was, was kind of seeing people get detrained, you know, kind of dramatically and come back from it really, really quickly. Like, I mean, I was able to train the whole time, but there were lots of people that weren't. And I don't know that I made more progress than those people, you know? Um, I, so I, I think there were some good insights to be had just from a, a training perspective. And uh, yeah, so I mean, that, that you know, as an athlete and a coach, I think those were some of the big things that I, I brought away from it. Yeah, I had a very similar experience and it, it really broke a lot of the understanding that I had about like what was needed, you know? Um, and it gave me some, like you said, really interesting insights on what a specific lifter needed. Like I had a lifter that was just able, to, just able to do push-ups and split squats. I think they had like jugs of milk or whatever that they did split squats with in their garden. They had to do like you know sets of twenty, maybe twenty-five, just to get the RPE to a degree where it was like, oh, I did something today. And then they do sprints on their bike as well. well. Not bike sprints, but they would go cycling and sometimes they would do some mm -hmm. high intensity work. And they had to come back like they didn't have a gym for like four months. And um, I figured, hey, you're coming back to the gym. Let's get your RP scale like individualized for you. So I did some like one RM, four RM, and eight RM testing. And the uh, <laughs> they do their one RM max test for like their squat, and they literally hit a five kilo PR. <laughs> and I was like, we had worked together for like three years. Yeah, we've been doing it all wrong. I think yeah. you remember you posting something about oh, that. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. It was like, yeah. what? Yeah. It broke me, man. I was like, okay, well, I learned a lot, but also, right. oh, fuck, man. I have and been now, doing... now I'm doubting everything. Yeah. yeah. I'm doubting everything we've ever done. No, yeah. I mean, I had similar experiences, but it was, it was like people that did that amount of work, like push-ups and split squats, you know, like just doing something in those movement patterns. Those people came back really quickly. Um, I mean, people that did nothing you know, struggled tremendously. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I mean, it, it was it was pretty amazing to me how how much people how I guess how little people got away with. Uh, you know, they they could reduce it pretty dramatically and and come back and like be in in surprisingly good shape. So yeah. So yeah, maybe maybe a lot of where I'm at now with all my all my volume talk earlier was influenced more by the pandemic than anything. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, well, when there's no constraints fuck well yeah why not do all the volume you know and then there's these right. massive constraints and it's like 
Well, if I if the narrative is you need this to get stronger, then well, you can't get stronger, I guess. So might as well you right. know not train. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like somebody, let's say they, you know, or or for me, like, let's say you know I I squat seven hundred pounds, and let's say I have the ability to load up two hundred pounds on a barbell, right? And and so like I'm going to have that for three months. Like, what what would be the right way for me to train? Like, do I do you know sets of fifty, you know, or like try to make it to where I make it like as hard as I possibly can, you know, and like find a way to make two hundred pounds as hard as I possibly can squatting, like, or is me just doing, you know, some reps that whole time, like just doing a few sets of five and whatever, finding ways to do split squats or like other ways that can be challenging, but just kind of keeping, keeping intact with the movement patterns, you know, is there noticeably more value or any more value for me doing, you know, get 500 reps of squats in a day or something with, with, you know, 200 pounds or something like that. Right. Like, and I, at this point I'd be like, it doesn't seem like it. Like people did body weight squats and they were fine. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is the craziest thing. And um, honestly, this conversation is like super cool. And I think for people listening, hopefully you guys think this is cool. I'm just like having a conversation at this point. Like, oh, sweet. I did the same thing because <laughs> it's hard to find that. You know, I think I felt pretty isolated after the pandemic um, kind of really got into things. I quit at RTS. I, I felt like there wasn't a lot of people I could talk to about lifting. I had a few people around me, my clients. It was great. But it did feel like there is a, like a lull, you know, in the industry where it was like, yeah, one, either people thought the pandemic was going to be a problem or not. And then there was like the people who were actively ignoring it completely. And that felt hard because like I didn't, you know, and it's hard for me to get kind of in the zone and I just didn't want to get sick. And, and so like, this is really nice for me because um, I can kind of reconnect with, with powerlifting and learn that like, Hey, we, we learned a lot to, you know. Yeah. on our own but like in a similar way and it feels a lot less um it feels more like there's a community of people that are experiencing similar things versus you know i guess in another sense like no nothing's changed why would you even change anything like just keep training it get sick who cares you know what i mean and and i think that's harder for me to relate to um so right. yeah i'm just glad that i had you on because uh i'm learning a lot from you and hopefully everyone else is listening can as well well, hopefully, hopefully all the people who I, who, uh, I talked about that, you know, that I said that listen to me say stuff and say like, well, it's easy for you to say, they'll hear you saying the same things and be like, well, fine. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, uh, more people, more people saying, yeah, it, if whatever. we can just validate our own biases, like a lot, then we'll have a bunch of clients that then are finding those biases and they're confirming their own. And then it's just, right. we have only right. yes men around this for the rest of our coaching career. If if me being super strong is the barrier for people to, to listen to me, well, good, we got Jim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's like my my selling point. I'm not even strong, guys. You can. <laughs> I don't have any bias. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, David, thanks for being on. Um, sure, man. Yeah, happy to come. Good talk. Cue 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 the outro.